Have you ever finished a game and thought to yourself, man, I wish there was more to this? Well, if you've played Pokemon Legends Arceus, then you've never thought of that. But for other instances, you're in luck, because there's this thing called DLC, or downloadable content, that lets you keep on playing your favorite games for a little while longer. Fortunately for me, most of my favorite games have DLC. You guys know at this point that I love the Soulsborne and Monster Hunter franchise, but there are other games that I don't talk about too much on this channel that have amazing additional content as well. I mean, nowadays DLC is more so the final piece to an incomplete game rather than being extra content to a should-be, well, finished game. I'm just saying, I'm not pointing any fingers out there. However, there are plenty of amazing DLCs out there that not only add on to a game, but it's actually the better end of it too. Most DLCs are small additions like a new game mode or a new weapon perhaps, or even new styles for your character. Oh, I'm definitely getting the Mohawk. However, what if I told you of a DLC that expanded the world, providing new areas, weapons, armor sets, and even bosses to fight? The Old Hunters DLC from Bloodborne. You guys knew I would talk about this. I mean, come on, it's one of the best DLCs in gaming if you ask me. I recently finished Bloodborne, and every single time I play the game, I am frothing at the mouth at just waiting to venture yes. through the DLC Squeeze once me! again. FromSoft in general nails it every time with their DLC because all of the best boss fights are there. Knight Artorias from Dark Souls 1, Slave Knight Gil from Dark Souls 3, and Ava the King's Pet from Dark Souls 2. Okay, you know, probably not that one. But when it comes to Bloodborne, the Old Hunters DLC provides some of my favorite bosses to date. Lady Maria, Orphan of Kos, the infamous Horseman. Not only that, but this DLC comes with new weapons for your hunter to try out, like the Pizza Roller and the Raikuyo, which I actually used for the first time in my most recent playthrough. Although, something that not many people talk about when it comes to this DLC are the areas, because, it, like, if you were to ask me what are some of my favorite levels or areas in gaming altogether, which will definitely be a video at some point, I want to play a few more games, but if you were to ask me that, one of them would be Fishing Hamlet, without question. I love the atmosphere of an old town buried beneath the waves of its past atrocities, its weathered look, the layout for Fishing Hamlet is amazing, and the attention to detail is incredible, not only because of the houses or landscape, but the enemies as well. Every single enemy you encounter reflects the aesthetic of Fishing Hamlet, covered in barnacles and answering the what-if question if Spongebob was real. You got the whale giants, the fish men, the fish uh, hounds, the fish fish, snail women, it all works so well together, and I personally love how every single enemy, except for Winter Lanterns, fits into the theme of this area. Like, I can make a whole video about why Fishing Hamlet is just phenomenal overall, but I'll leave it there for now. I already touched upon it, but the bosses in the DLC are amazing as well, and again, they are the best bosses in the game. I like Ludwig, you know, Orphan of Cost, th the famous ones, but I think the living failures should take some credit because I enjoy their fight. Watching them flail around and perform a cult ritual in the middle of a fight is dedication, and I respect the craft. Lawrence, I know, I know a lot of people don't like his fight, but I'm in the minority. I like it. I think it's great. The first time he popped his legs off, I thought the fight was over. But you want to know the best part about this DLC? The absolute best part is that it's only 20 bucks. That is well worth the content in the old hunters. I would pay $40 nowadays for this amount of content. But then again, I'm probably some blood nut fanboy stuck in 2014. I'll give this DLC 10 blood vials out of 10 and we'll move on. One of the most recent DLC to come out was none other than the delicious last cup from Corsehead. It was a bit short considering the amount of time we had to wait for it, but I don't blame the team because it's a small team, and I'm sure it took a lot of effort to perfect the animations and style of this game. I mean, look at this cow that then turns into a sausage and then turn into a, a can of spam, I guess. It's weird, but I love it. And overall, the Cuphead DLC was pretty good. This game is all about challenging boss fights, and the DLC definitely delivered. It was basically more of the same, but when you have a game that's already so good, more of the same is okay with me. Just as long as they don't overdo it. Anyways, each boss was unique and had completely different patterns from not only each other, but their own phases as well. This giant went from hand puppets to eating me alive, forcing me to fight his... I don't know, stomach lining, I guess? It was fun though. This wizard would bring out fully grown whales to slam them on the ground, use magic, only to transform into a snowflake in the last phase. Ironically, I think my favorite one is the cowgirl that I mentioned earlier because she's both challenging and fun, and I just like her design the most. She also has the same name as my mom, so that's a big bonus too. 
I finished the DLC in about four hours, I think. Most of my time being taken up by the salt chef guy. I don't remember his name, but he was tough. And I was still left wanting more. I figured out later there was a secret boss in the gravesite, which easily became one of my favorite fights in the entire game. I talked about it before, but it's like booze from Mario, just polar opposites, whichever one you face becomes angry, and the one behind you is passive. Like I said before, it's more of the same, and it's a bit short, but for $8, uh, that's not bad at all. I give it 7 cups out of 10. I am a huge fan of the Smash franchise. I grew up with it, I hold it very close to my heart, and it's one of my favorite games growing up. I was a beast in Super Smash Bros. Melee. Now in Smash Ultimate, even though I am a King K. Rool main for life, I couldn't help but throw my money at Nintendo and try out some new DLC characters. Piranha Plant, Steve, and a couple of others. This game's DLC is a bit different from most other DLC that I'll mention because it's more so related to the multiplayer aspect and the current meta of the game. I know for a fact that Joker is an insane character because I have gone up against him and every single time I lose. But with Joker being added to the roster, he potentially shifts the meta and what characters players use, how they play against him, things like that. I love the concept of adding new characters to any multiplayer game because it, it keeps things fresh, gives something new for players to sink their teeth into, another thing to complain about, or rank them on the updated tier list. My only problem with this type of DLC is the power creep issue where the new characters are busted and the old ones are left in the dust of Scarlet Rot. Apex Legends hasn't had too much of this problem, although I haven't played it in about a year, but even back then, there were 11 new DLC characters with each new season, and I hopped all over the place using a variety of legends. Not saying that some were worse than others, they definitely were, but it wasn't to the point where nobody was using them. And yes, Watson is still my favorite, I don't care what anyone says, she's great. Smash Ultimate, on the other hand, I think has this issue because most of the DLC characters have abilities or mechanics that just... it just makes them ridiculous. Joker, when his persona is fully charged, gives him the strength of Ganondorf, but he still retains his insane speed. Terry at 100% or above can just wreck you with his Power Geyser or other ultimate attacks that do not have a cooldown. Uh, it, he can just do it until he dies. Steve can do this. Fire! Yeah. <laughs> But my point here is that these new characters further bridge the gap between the top tier and the trash tier fighters, making some of them completely unplayable in certain matchups. Which hurts me a lot because I like King DDD, Piranha Plant, and the other underdogs. I give this type of DLC a piss and dookie out of a toilet. Uh, that's a bad score if you don't know. Then why did I mention this in a video titled My Favorite DLCs in Video Games? I have no idea. Now, Monster Hunter for the longest time would release the base game, and later on, release the G rank or Master rank version as a separate game with stronger monsters, new equipment, things like that. It then started in Monster Hunter World, where the Master rank version became an expansion that you could buy and attach to the base game if you already had it. Expansions count as DLC, I looked it up, it's basically the same thing, and with that being said, these expansions are the best DLC I've seen in gaming thus far. If you haven't played Monster Hunter at all, just know that the Master Rank version is basically where the end game happens, where most of the challenge and fun occurs. Monster Hunter Rise is the newest edition, and it wasn't exactly my favorite in the series, but the expansion called Sunbreak completely flipped my perspective on the game. One of my main issues with the base game was it was too easy and too short. You had your credits roll halfway through the village quests, you weren't even done, you didn't even face the final boss. How much sense does that make? Sunbreak not only added a plethora of new monsters and a complete story, but the game is actually kind of difficult now. I've been saying this since Sunbreak came out, the quality of the fights in this game are seriously top notch. You have this panther-like wyvern that can turn invisible during attacks and surprise you with a gnarly tail slam. There's this voluptuous flying wyvern with explosive scales that he can scatter around the arena, and even detonate all of them at once for an ultimate attack. There's even an ice wolverine monster that can stand up on his hind legs and slash away at you like some ferocious beast, mainly because it is. Because Sunbreak has advanced its combat mechanics so much, the creativity behind these monsters can really shine, bringing all of what they can do to the fight, and it's phenomenal. Not to mention there's this new endgame grind, they change it up a bit every Monster Hunter game, 
and this one makes you fight afflicted monsters, basically monsters with an attitude, that deal more damage, have more health, but drop amazing materials to further strengthen your gear. Right now I'm kind of overwhelmed, uh, in a good way of course, because I don't know where to go next. Do I want to upgrade this new weapon tree, build a new armor set, gather more afflicted materials, or perhaps play Horizon Zero Dawn? But seriously though, Sunbreak definitely fixed the game, and if the DLC can fix a game, then it has to be incredible. I will say however, okay, Sunbreak does fall into the category of a DLC that finishes a game rather than adds icing to the cake like it should. Like Sunbreak should have been Monster Hunter Rise. Not to mention that the expansion was 40 bucks on top of a $60 game you had to play first. But even then, the experience and amount of time I played this game already is definitely worth the $100. Bro, I spent $100 on a Yu-Gi-Oh card. $100 on a Yu-Gi-Oh card a few weeks ago. So spending $100 for a game that gives you countless hours of fun is worth it if you ask me. Maybe by comparison a little bit more expensive than you're used to, but hey, I'm a Monster Hunter nerd, so it makes sense that I'm cool with it. That being said, I give the Sunbreak expansion 10 mantles out of 10. Lastly, I want to talk about the Doom Eternal's two-part DLC, The Ancient Gods. I absolutely adore the Doom franchise, I don't know if you knew this, but I love it and it's great. It's the most wholesome game out there, ridding the world of demons in the most brutal way possible. What's better than that? The Ancient Gods builds upon the lore of the Doom Slayer, something which hasn't really been touched, so it's nice to have a bit more insight on this mysterious character. But what really makes this DLC, let's be honest, is the almighty demon slaying extravaganza. New demons to fight, new levels, tougher bosses, it's all an upgrade to the base game, and I absolutely adore the aesthetic and design of this game. If I'm being honest, I mean seriously, the look and structure of Doom's levels are some of my favorites in gaming history. The attention to detail in this game is amazing, and for those of you who don't know, I love disturbing imagery, grotesque displays of body horror, things like that. It's why I love horror games so much. But Doom is insane. Even the freaking tutorial has writhing bodies in cages, and it just gets better from there. Call me disturbed, but I love the aesthetic of this franchise. When it comes to the DLC, I love how they threw at you new demons that forced you to adapt your playstyle. Take the Cursed Prowler for example. This guy slows down the Slayer when he hits you, demoning you to an immobile sentry that can't even jump off the ground. You gotta give the demon a good punch to the THROAT in order to remove the curse. There's also the Armored Baron who is susceptible to the plasma rifle since it blows off his armor the fastest. You could also destroy his flail during his attacks to destroy the armor instantaneously, but it's not like you can just tank the hits and go in guns a blazing. I mean you can, but you're gonna die. These are just a couple of demons from the DLC that makes you rethink your positioning and who you want to take down first. It's a nice change of pace that doesn't stray too far from the core of what Doom is. The new bosses are pretty cool too, my favorite being the Dark Lord, who is you in the demon realm, makes perfect sense, and his fight is, is actually kind of tough. He can summon just a bunch of demons that crowd the rather cramped arena, but a simple hammer time from the DLC will disperse all who get between you and the boss. Later on, after these two DLCs were released, they also introduced Horde Mode, which is amazing. I haven't really extensively put many hours into this mode, but from what I've gathered, uh, it's simply a lot of fun. And that's when you know a game's gameplay loop is phenomenal. Horde modes in gaming is kind of the seal of approval for me if a game has great gameplay mechanics. You start off with a combat shotgun, and as you clear waves and enter bonus levels if you're good enough, you unlock the rest of your weapons and can go full on Demon Slayer. Overall, I love what Doom Eternal brings to the table. I'll give it 9 tyrants out of 10. So, for DLC to be good, he needs to do two things. Provide a healthy amount of content, to justify the price at least, and the content has to be good. This may sound simple, but you'd be surprised on how many games get this wrong. So, yeah. Some of the DLC I mentioned today are some of my favorites, but I have to give it to the Old Hunters DLC from Bloodborne because, like, this game does not rely on the DLC to be good, unlike Sunbreak, and the Old Hunters has enough content to justify its price, and it's just, it's plain good. It could be its own separate game. Let me know some of your favorite DLCs in gaming, and of course, if you did enjoy this video, be sure to leave a like, and to subscribe for more content like this. And I'll see you in the next video. Take care everyone, and of course, stay safe.